ओके देन नमस्ते आदाब सत श्रीकाल दिस इज सीए संकल्प कांस्टिया वेलकमिंग ईच वन ऑफ यू इन दिस अमेजिंग सेशन लेट द सीए फाइनल फुल इंग्लिश रिवीजन बिगिन and today is the session which is going to be held on the chapter mutual funds a guaranteed 8 to 10 in your examination and guys we are not only going to do the concepts we will also do the formulas we will also do the practical questions so are you all excited but before that have you subscribed to the channel please ensure that you are subscribing to the channel and clicking on the bell icon so that you get all the updates related to this subject and scpf on a regular basis at the same time how to study the study techniques how to score good marks in each subject many more motivational things coming your way so stay subscribed and uh, obviously like the video if you feel that this initiative is going to help you in some way now on that note let me tell you that how are we going to proceed with this whole thing so i will be teaching you from my magic book uh, if you don't have it my suggestion will be you can definitely buy it it is just going to cost you approximately 299 also i will give you the link in the description and the comment box so you can purchase the magic book this book will change the way you approach this subject because this book will have all the formulas theory and exam day master questions at one place in approximately 350 pages so the 1.5 day dilemma of your examination will be taken care of so your third revision and 1.5 days during the examination will easily be taken care of from here chalo now let's start so i will be starting this mutual fund chapter from obviously the magic book because as i told you it will cover everything now where will you get this magic book from if you have the physical copy well and good you can order it from my website from the website given in the comments box if you want to see the pdf if you want to understand the pdf then in that case i'm sharing the pdf on my telegram channel so telegram channel link is also given you can subscribe to the telegram channel there we are also sharing on a regular basis the mcqs and all of that so that will also benefit you in a very very large extent see this is the book that i'm talking about and all the formulas concepts at one place in a very systematic manner plus i have also given references wherever possible that you know this is the icai question 17 from the module and all of that is there so that will be really helpful to you at the end on the exam day what are the master sums that need to be done because in the exams uh, in that 1.5 days we are not sure as to which sum should we do which will be helpful for our examination so this book will also help you for the same because the master sums which cover all the concepts are taken here so you can on the exam day directly refer them all right guys and plus the revision videos are also connected to this so that also will be helpful to you on that note let us start so please open your magic book or the pdf from the telegram channel in the comment box the telegram channel is there you can join in and please share this with all your south india students who are going to give their examination and it will be helpful to them because this lecture is specially for you you guys so full english and uh, more sessions will be coming any specific chapter that you want you can let me know in the comments and i will definitely bring in for you also a few students have also been asking that sir do we have the full english batch and let me tell you that yes if any of you need a ca final full english batch that also is available exam oriented regular batch approximately 160 to 175 hours complete coverage when i say complete coverage 100% icai rtp mtp past papers everything is there and most importantly concept clarity with formula derivations is how we will go you can check out for my demo lectures and you will realize that how depth we go and how simple way we solve the sums with special focus on uh, my favorite chapters forex and derivatives so these are the chapters which are going to be very important for ibs also so might as well do it in a very better way so we can you know uh, score the maximum marks in afm and in ibs because this forex derivatives everything is connected so if you leave one chapter in option you are possibly leaving many things in option which obviously you don't want in a scoring subject like afm which can ensure to increase your average marks all right guys chalo on that note time for us to start with the session we will be starting with the the chapter mutual funds yes telegram channel download the pdf and let the game begin anything else you want from my end do share in the comments box and i will try my best to get it for you let the game begin
ओके तो द फर्स्ट एंड मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट इज द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ नेट एसेट वैल्यू इन म्यूचुअल फंड द म्यूचुअल फंड इज बॉट एंड सोल्ड एट अ प्राइस कॉल्ड एज नेट एसेट वैल्यू सो व्हाट इज नेट एसेट वैल्यू इट इज द मार्केट वैल्यू ऑफ ऑल द इन्वेस्टमेंट्स दैट द म्यूचुअल फंड होल्ड लेस एनी आउटस्टैंडिंग लायबिलिटीज और एक्सपेंसेस इनकर्ड और टू बी इनकर्ड बाय द म्यूचुअल फंड डिवाइड बाय द आउटस्टैंडिंग नंबर ऑफ म्यूचुअल फंड एज ऑन दैट डेट now how do you calculate the market value of investment so see here a mutual fund can invest in various assets like a equity share like a debenture like a real estate like a gold it can also keep some money as cash with itself all together when we compute the market value of all these investments plus the equity share will also give some dividend the debenture will give some interest bonds will give interest real estate may give some uh, rental income all of that income together with the market value of the financial assets that we hold is what will comprise the total net asset value of which we will reduce the outstanding liabilities or expenses which are to be incurred which will give us the net asset value and finally divide that by the number of outstanding units we will get the net asset value per unit so as a mutual fund company we can invest in equity shares so dividend received and market value of shares debenture bonds debenture interest and market value of bonds other investment any residual income from that so other investment could be a gold could be a real estate so real estate uh, rental income and market value of that investment other accrued income capital appreciation of any other assets plus cash all of that combined together is my work uh, is my market value of investment to which i will reduce the outstanding liabilities accrued expenses and other amount payable amount not invested in the fund is kept in cash and that cash will also form part of the net asset value why do you keep cash so for redemptions dividend payment or any other purposes the mutual fund companies keep cash with itself in case of debt securities accrue interest for the given period which is also added as income in the nav calculation in one of the questions in your module there is accrued interest so that also is to be added here so debenture interest is also to be added here while calculating the market value of investment okay this adjustment of accrued interest is done whether mentioned or not in the question dividend as well as interest are always calculated on face value so always remember they will give you the market price of the share or of the bond but the dividend is never calculated on that dividend is always calculated on the face value so in all the nav per unit is total net asset value upon the outstanding number of units two important points which i have specifically written in the note one is that take four decimals while calculating nav per unit and two decimals while calculating the number of units and returns of mutual fund so if they are asking what is the nav per unit 21.3742 write it fully if you want to know total number of units say 1 lakh divided by the nav is 12 so 1 lakh divided by 12 say uh, works out to 8 Eight thousand three hundred and thirty-three point three three. So two decimals for units and four decimals while calculating NAV per unit. Now, if any additional units is issued or redeemed, then how is going to be the calculation in an open-ended fund? Additional units are subscribed are read and redeemed on daily basis. So when a unit holder purchases additional units then it is a inflow for the mutual fund company and when the unit holder redeems the mutual fund unit then in that case it is a outflow for the mutual fund company which will be adjusted while calculating the nav so market value of all investments including cash as we did in the last uh, thing plus any receivable accrued income now comes the most important point units issued into nav per unit so whatever units we are issuing for the nav the amount of money that we are going to get is a income or is a inflow for the mutual fund company which will be added in nav but if there is any units redeemed that will be reduced from for calculating nav now whenever there is new units issued then in that case the number of outstanding units will increase so opening units plus units subscribed less units redeemed will give us the a number of outstanding units so what is the closing units opening plus units redeemed uh, plus units issued less units redeemed now calculation of nav when daily information is given so at times daily information will be given to you so how do you calculate the nav in such situation so opening nav will always be given to you what is opening nav yesterday's nav per unit 
into the number of units outstanding as of yesterday. So that is yesterday's NAV. Now in this full day, if you know that SEBI requires daily once the NAV to be updated. So whenever yesterday the NAV was updated, NAV per unit into on that day the number of units that were there. That is my total NAV. As of yesterday, now in the whole day, in the whole 24 hours, if new units are issued, then there is inflow of money. So, money received on issue of new units. If there is any redemption, money paid on redemption of units. If you receive during the whole day any dividend, any interest, whatever portfolio appreciation happens, only the portfolio appreciation because the market value is already taken care of here. The market value is already taken care of here. So only the appreciation or depreciation in the portfolio. So we can also write here depreciation in portfolio is taken care of here. All of this together will become the closing nap. This divide by the number of outstanding number of units will give me my NAV per unit. So as today's number of units plus units issued less units redeemed will give me my uh, NAV per unit. Okay. Next is the treatment of cash in the mutual fund. So at times they will give you few adjustments relating to the cash balance. As of matter of fact, now we know that closing cash balance also forms part of the net asset value. So the closing cash balance should be calculated properly. So what happens? How do you calculate the closing cash balance? By doing certain adjustments and see finally you will get the closing cash balance. So a question may come wherein only closing cash balance may have to be calculated. So how do you do that? First opening cash or bank, whatever is given to us in the question, then cash received. When will you receive cash? On new units. So whatever issue of units are there, cash received. If while receiving the new units, there are any expenses that you are incurring, less investment to purchase financial assets, all of that is adjusted and then we will get the opening cash balance. So what happens is suppose there is a new mutual fund. In the new mutual fund, the number of units are issued at the rate NAV per unit 10. So whatever money is received, less there are initial issue expenses, reduce that. Less immediately once we have received the money, say 1 lakh units we have issued at the rate 10. So we receive rupees 10 lakh. Of this 10 lakh, we are purchasing shares worth rupees 8 lakh. So less investment to purchase financial assets. Now we are left with 2 lakh closing balance in which add proceeds from sale of securities. If after say few days we are selling few securities, so we are getting the money on sale of securities, right? Add interest or dividend income received from security. So if there are any equity shares in which mutual fund has invested, if they give any interest or dividend, that also is to be added. Less cost of securities purchased, any new securities that we are going to purchase, fund management expenses paid, distribution of capital gain and dividend distribution from retained earnings pay attention. Now, whatever money that the mutual fund company is receiving is obviously belonging to the unit holders. Whatever money that they have received, if they are distributing to the unit holders as a dividend or as a capital gain, then in that case, that also is to be deducted. Whatever you will be left with will be called as the closing cash balance, which is to be added while calculating the net asset value. So inflow received by the mutual fund new units issued by mutual fund company to investors, less investment done by mutual fund which is outflow, you will get the closing cash balance to be added while calculating the net asset value. So just go through this formula that is given here again and you will be very clear. The uh, During the time of NFO, the mutual fund company receives applications. So units issued multiply by the NAV per unit, total money received, of which there will be few issue expenses, reduce that of which they, the remaining amount will be invested in shares. The remaining amount is a closing cash balance. Now, whatever amount that you have invested in shares, they may give you some dividend. Whatever amount you have invested in debentures of bond, they may give you some interest. Add it to the closing cash balance. Of the amount invested, it is possible that you may sell a few of the shares. So when you sell the shares, you will get the money again added to the cash balance. Of the money that you have received, you may again invest in some other security like a, a equity share or a bond or a debenture, you again reduce it from the cash balance. Of all the churning, as in of all the money received and paid, again you feel that few amount should be given distributed to the unit holders 
then again that amount will be reduced because distribution to the unit holders in the form of dividend or capital gain will also result into a cash outflow and the remaining is your closing cash balance. I hope we are very much clear. Next is the treatment of dividend. Now this at times confuses the students that's the reason I have specifically taken here. Dividend will have two forms. One a dividend received by the mutual fund company and the other is dividend paid by the mutual fund company. When will the dividend be received by the mutual fund company? When the mutual fund company has invested in some equity shares and that equity shares distributes dividend. That is an inflow to the mutual fund company. And of all the money that the mutual fund company has, if it feels of distributing some of it as dividend to the unit holders, then it will be an outflow by the mutual fund company. I hope you are clear. So POV for mutual fund company, if it invests in equity shares, Dividend is equal to inflow to the mutual fund, part of NAV and added to calculation of NAV. But when dividend is distributed, dividend is outflow for the mutual fund company, deducted from NAV of mutual fund and added to the return of investor. When the mutual fund company distributes dividend, then it is added to the return of investor. I hope we are clear. Then comes return from mutual fund to investors. Here, there are three types of returns that we can see. One, dividend from the mutual fund. Again, this is return of mutual fund to the investor. So, suppose you have invested in a mutual fund company. What is the return that you are expecting? One, you are expecting a dividend from the mutual fund company. Second is the capital gain disbursement or capital gain distribution. Again, when a mutual fund company invests in equity shares, and when it sell those equity shares, suppose I am a mutual fund company, I have invested in an equity share worth rupees 1 lakh. I have sold those equity shares for rupees 1 lakh 25,000. The 25,000 differential is basically called as capital gain. That capital gain disbursement, that capital gain uh, disbursement, or distribution to the unit holders is what is written here. So one, you get dividend from mutual fund, capital gain from the mutual fund. Another is the change in the value of the mutual fund, which is like a capital appreciation or a depreciation, which is closing nav minus the opening nav. Now, what is the holding period return? Whatever holding, whatever period you have holding the uh, mutual fund, in that period, the return that you have got, you can hold it for one day, one month, one year, 10 years, five years, whatever it is. So NAV at the end minus NAV at the beginning. So whenever you purchase the mutual fund at that point in time, what was your investment? We will call it as the NAV at beginning. Mine, and that difference is compared with the NAV at the end. So we started, NAV at the beginning was 15. NAV at the end, now we want to sell it, it is say 85. So 85 minus 15, 70 is like the capital appreciation. Plus, if any dividend income is received in this duration, plus any capital gain income is received by the investor in this duration, divide by the original investment, which is NAV at the beginning. Now, what is your annualized period return or annualized return, annualized yield? The HPR, this is the HPR holding period return, multiply by, if you want to uh, find the annual return, so 12 months, divide by the given months, or if it is week, multiply by the 52 weeks, divide by the given weeks, and 365 days divided by the days. Are we clear everybody? Done. Then comes the close. Then comes the close ended fund. Now in case of close ended fund. The buying and selling of mutual fund unit. Is not on the basis of NAV. But it is on the basis of market price. So whatever is the market price. At that market price you will purchase or sell. The closed ended fund are issued during NFO, but later on traded on the market value on secondary market. So open ended funds, you can directly go to the mutual fund company at the prevalent NAV, you will buy and sell the mutual fund. But in case of closed ended fund, if you want to buy after the NFO period, or if you want to sell after the NFO period, you can do it only through the stock exchange, which is a secondary market. Now, suppose if the NAV is 12, market price is 14. If you want to purchase the mutual fund of closed ended mutual fund, you will have to do it at the market price, which is 14. Even if you want to sell it, it will be at 14. Mutual fund trading in the market at premium. So if NAV is 12 and market price is of that close ended fund is 14, then we will say that market, uh, the, the close ended fund is trading at premium. 
as against here if the nav is 12 and market price is 9 then we will say mutual fund is trading in the market at discount i hope we are clear with this point note discount premium is always calculated on the net asset value so discount or premium will be calculated on net asset value meaning they will give you that okay the nav of this current mutual fund is rupees 20 however the market price is trading at a 20 percent premium so you have to add 20 percent premium on 20 so 20 plus 20 percent will give you 24 rupees that will become the market price or they may also say that the nav is rupees 15 and it is trading at a discount of 10 percent so 15 minus 10 percent discount we will get 13.5 that will become the market price of the close ended fund and that is the price at which it will be traded for the unit holders got it okay now what is the return as same as the above so sale price stock price at the stock market price minus purchase price plus dividend or other income divided by the purchase price is your return if opening and closing number of units is same then calculation should be done on per unit basis however if the number of units of opening and closing are different then always use the totality basis now what is this number of units so say if uh, my opening units and closing units are same then you can do it on a per unit basis but if there is a change in the number of units always do it in totality that will be really really helpful for y'all are we clear everybody done now we come to the next concept and that is the types of mutual fund there are three types of mutual fund which are there one in terms of growth the second is in terms of dividend reinvestment and third is in terms of dividend payout now whatever you are comfortable with if you are a long-term investor you will go with the growth scheme because here there is no dividend distributed in the between the or whatever money that the mutual fund is making it will be reinvested in equity shares and other securities it will be reinvested no dividend will be distributed that is growth plan it, the second is the dividend reinvestment plan wherein if the mutual fund company distributes dividend that dividend is reinvested by the investor at the prevalent nav and the last is the dividend payout if you want a regular inflow of income the mutual fund company you can choose a dividend payout plan wherein the mutual fund company will regularly distribute the dividend. So these are the three schemes, growth scheme, dividend reinvestment scheme and dividend payout scheme. I hope we are clear. So see here, I have given a table for the explanation. When you see this table, you will see that in growth, there is no dividend, no additional units. NAV, NAV will change ideally, but value of holding before and after dividend it will not change. See now when I say here NAV will not change, what it means is this. In case of dividend payout and dividend reinvestment option, suppose the NAV is 15. Suppose the NAV is 15. And suppose if a dividend of 2 rupees is distributed, so automatically this 2 will be reduced from here and the new NAV will become 13. Whereas here in case of growth, the uh, there is no dividend distribution at all. And since there is no dividend distribution, obviously the NAV will not change. It will remain what it was, which is 15. That's the reason here it is written no. I hope you got the point. Value of holding before and after dividend obviously will not change. Uh, year. year also it will not change because the amount of dividend that you have received is reinvested again in the mutual fund at the X nav which is 13. So overall the value of holding will become same as it was earlier and in case of dividend obviously uh, dividend payout the value of holding and value of nav will decline. Got it? So this is what the whole concept of growth, dividend reinvestment and dividend payout is all about. So in terms of growth, you don't have to do anything. You have purchased, now wait for 5 years, 10 years, whatever time frame that you have taken. See after 5 years, what is the NAV? Sell it at that value, the growth pattern is done. Dividend reinvestment is the most crucial because here, as soon as you receive the dividend, whatever amount of dividend that you have received will be reinvested in purchasing the new units and your number of units will increase. But this purchase will be at X NAV price. What is X NAV price? After dividend, the NAV will decrease and that price you will reinvest the dividend received and get the additional units. In case of dividend payout, it is very simple. Whatever dividend that you are receiving will be yours. Game over. So I hope you are clear with all of these three schemes. Now let's take an example to understand the above scheme. 
growth scheme 50000 rupees nav is 10 you will get 5000 units now over a period of time the nav increases to 15 per unit mutual fund declares rupees 2 per dividend of 2 per unit no impact on growth nav is again 15 new nav is 15 number of units 5000 and total value is now 5000 into 15 which is 75000 now take two in case of dividend reinvestment the 50000 rupees will be first invested at nav of 10 per unit you will get 5000 units the new nav becomes 15 and now the mutual fund company declares a dividend of rupees 2 per unit so 15 minus 2 will become 13 so the new nav post dividend nav post dividend will become 13 i hope we are clear now whatever dividend that you have received so you had originally 5000 unit and 2 rupees per unit is the dividend received so you will receive rupees 10000 as the dividend for this 10000 dividend the nav post dividend is 13 per unit so 10000 divided by 13 you will get 769.23 units you will get 769.23 units got it new nav 13 new units will become 5769.23 because the 10000 dividend received is reinvested at x nav price which is 13 you got 769.23 new units so total is 5769.23 units multiply that by 13 per unit multiply that by 13 per unit which is nav post dividend so 5769.23 into 13 will give you 7500 uh, 75000 and that's what we told you that the total value will not change got it in case of dividend payout very simple whatever is the dividend you have received you will keep it with you the new nav will become 13 and the new value will become 13 into 5000 which is 65000 rupees and 10000 you have received as dividend if market is expected to show upward trend we choose the dividend reinvestment plan if it is planning to show the downward trend then better to take dividend and choose the dividend payout plan so if we expect the market to go up we will take a growth or a dividend reinvestment else yeah so even growth we can take else we will take the dividend payout if we are expecting the market to go down got it done now there is a question in icai module question number 17 which is a classic question to explain the whole concept of dividend reinvestment and bonus as well so let's start with this question here itself and let's solve this very crucial question here so how to solve practical question of dividend reinvestment scheme mr x purchases 10000 units of abc mutual fund at a uh, nav of rupees 10 per unit so nav is 10 10000 units is what you have so total 1 lakh rupees is what you have invested now you get a dividend of 20% and 40% remember dividend is always calculated on the face value the face value is rupees 10 per unit so 20, 10 uh, per unit into 20% is equal to rupees 2 per unit 10 into 40% is equal to 4 per unit this is how the dividend is going to be received now that dividend will be reinvested at the prevalent nav let's see here so opening stock basically opening stock here is the 10000 units and closing units 10000 units this is just the opening now on say 15th of january you are receiving 2 rupees as dividend we already calculated this 2 rupees here right so 10 into 20 percent, two rupees is the dividend that you have got. Total there are 10,000 units. Multiply by two per unit as the dividend. We will get 20,000 rupees as dividend, which we will reinvest on the X on the NAV prevalent on that date. The NAV prevalent on that day say is 12. So 20,000 dividend divided by prevalent and i have 12 we will get 1666.67 units right so now the new number of units will become 10000 plus 1667 and 11667 this 11667 will now get a dividend of 4 earlier it was 10000 units what we got the dividend of 2 now the number of units has increased to 11667 per unit dividend is 4 so we will get 11667 into 4 which is 46667 and the nav per unit is rupees 15 so we will get the new units and that is 3111.13 so 11666.67 so 11666.67 plus 3111.13 So we will get fourteen thousand seven seventy seven point eight units. 
So this is how my dividend reinvestment plan works. Now again, if a new dividend is distributed, then 14,777.8 units multiply by the new dividend per unit and we will get the new dividend which will be reinvested at the prevalent NAV. You will get more units. I hope we are clear with the dividend reinvestment plan. There is also a concept of bonus ratio. Pay attention. So in case the com uh, you have 10,000 units and the company plans to issue a bonus, say of 5 is to 4. Now, how do you interpret this 5 is to 4? So you will get 5 units bonus for 4 units held. So we will do a 5 is to 4 here. So you already have 10,000 units, guys. Cross multiply, we will get 12,500 units in bonus. Got it? So 12,500 units bonus. Already we have 10,000 units. Total what we get is 22,500 units. Again, they are distributing a bonus of 1 is to 3. So for every 3 units held, 1 unit you will get as bonus. So we are already holding 22,500. Cross multiply, multiply by 1 divided by 3. We will get 7,500 units as bonus. So in this 22,500, 7,500 is added and we will get 30,000 units closing units and that will be multiplied by the prevalent time as the case may be. Alright guys, so this is how you solve a question related to the bonus plan. So dividend reinvestment, dividend payout, growth, bonus, I hope everything is now crystal clear to us. Now, just one step ahead here, the last step for solving these kind of sums is the impact of taxation as well. Now, whenever we redeem the uh, mutual fund units, we have to pay a securities transaction tax. This we have to pay only if the question says. So now the redemption value, whatever is the redemption value, closing number of units multiplied by the closing NAV, to which we will apply the securities transaction tax percentage. So say for example, at the redemption date, I have 20,000 units and the value is say uh, 15 rupees per unit. So 20,000 into 15. The total value of my units is 3 lakh. Two with securities transaction tax, they assume 1% will be deducted. So less 1% is deducted. 2,97,000 is my net amount received. Now, this is securities transaction tax. Now, we will get a short-term capital gain tax also. Only on units sold within one year of redemption. See, again, these are all subjective things because they are dependent on the Finance Act. So whatever Finance Act says, whatever is the short term capital gain duration that you will take as of now, it is one year. So I have taken this as one year. So selling price per unit minus reinvested cost into short term tax capital percentage minus investment, we will get the final return from the mutual fund. So it's quick an example ke through some of the karte. So say for example, you have 20 rupees mein sell kiya, wo aapka selling price per unit hai, wo aapka naya hai. Usme se 1% to aapka gaya, kis mein, mera STT ka gaya, to utna 1% to mein minus kar dunga, to mere paas bachega 19.8 minus. Suppose mera purchasing price tha 15, to this will become 4.8 multiply by the number of units say 10,000 units. So this will become 19.8 minus 15 into 10,000, 48,000 aa gaya. Assume करते हैं 10% का STCG है 4,800 आपको देना पड़ेगा as a short term capital gain tax Are you clear everybody? So, so I got carried away with Hindi Let's discuss this again So selling price per unit is 20 per unit of mutual fund Of which 1% we will give for the securities transaction tax Which we have already deducted above So 19.8 is my net selling price of which 15 I will deduct as my purchase cost. So I am left with 4.8 as a capital gain, short term capital gain per unit. Multiply by the 10,000 units that I have into the tax percentage, which is 10%. So say 48,000, 4,800 will be my tax, less investment. Now, whatever I am left with is my real return. I hope we are clear. Now comes a new concept called as the concept of realized and unrealized gain. So guys, with this, we have completed the growth, dividend reinvestment, bonus, dividend payout, the calculation of taxation, STT, STCG, all the points have been covered here. Now, the concept of realized and unrealized gains in mutual funds, this is very important. You can distribute dividend as per SEBI only from the realized gains. Now, what is a realized gain? Suppose there are equity shares that the mutual fund company has purchased. 
you have purchased Reliance Equity shares at the rate 2000 rupees. Today the price is 3000. So the 1000 profit is unrealized gain till the time you sell it. Suppose now if you have sold it at 3000 rupees, then it becomes that 1000 rupees per share becomes a realized gain. So 1000 will become my realized gain. I hope we are clear. So dividend can be distributed only from the realized gain. What is a realized gain? I told you all. Dividend received from equity share investment is a realized gain. Capital gain earned on sale of equity share is a realized gain. Interest income earned on debenture or bonds is a realized gain. The dividend can be distributed only on the realized gain because in one question they have written that out of the realized gain 80% was distributed. Now look at the word out of the realized gain. Only on sale of equity share does the capital gain become realized. From that only you can distribute the dividend. What is unrealized gains? Portfolio gain without sale of securities unrealized gains. No dividend can be distributed to the unrealized gains. Got it guys? Done. Next is called as the expense ratio. Now, every mutual fund company also has to incur a lot of expenses. So, what is the total expenses that you are incurring as regards your total lab? I'll give you a small example of your article ship. Suppose in your article ship, you are earning 10,000 rupees as stipend. Of that 10,000, 1,000 goes in traveling, 2,000 goes in eating and 1,000 goes in miscellaneous expenditure. Uh, expenditure. So, 1,000 plus 2,000, 3,000 plus 1,000, 4,000. So, 4,000 is your expense. 10,000 is your stipend. So, can I say 40% is your expense ratio? Exactly this is what it is. So, here whatever is the NAV you have as compared to that what is the expenses that you are incurring that percentage will give you the expense ratio of a mutual fund. So, management expenses of a mutual fund divided by average value of our portfolio or management expense per unit divided by average NAV per unit. Now, what is a expense? Annual maintenance charges, uh, includes annual operating cost, management fees, advertising cost, all of that is a part of your expense ratio. So, what is the expense that you have incurred as regards the total value of portfolio or what is the management expense per unit divided by the average NAV per unit is your expense ratio. Are we clear everybody? Yes, sir. Next is the concept of load. This is a very important concept. Now, when the mutual fund company is selling the mutual fund units to the mutual fund company, that basically is called as the sale price, right? So, when the mutual fund company is selling the mutual fund to the investor, it is called as the sale price. But now think from the investor point of view. From the investor point of view, he is purchasing. And when you are purchasing anything, you are paying brokerage extra. So say for example, I want to purchase a mutual fund unit of worth rupees 500. On that, I have to pay 10% commission. This load is basically nothing but your commission charged by the mutual fund on sale or purchase of a mutual fund. Now 500 rupees is what I am going to give to the mutual fund company plus there is a load, a commission of 10% say the so total will become 550. Mutual fund company has sold that unit to me. Therefore, it is called as a sale price. I have purchased it, but on that I have to pay additional brokerage or the load. So that load is added here. So NAV into 1 plus fund and load percentage is what we write here. I hope we are clear. And then there is also something called as the exit load. Now, when the investor is entering the mutual fund it is called as the entry load or also called as the front end load all right and why do we use the word sale price because the mutual fund company is selling that mutual fund to us so sell price is equal to nav into one plus front end load percentage what is nav sale price upon front end load percentage and the last is front end load percentage is equal to sale price upon nav minus one one formula that you have to do is this other all formulas are just the derivation of the above main formula. The way you, the, the way the mutual fund company is selling it, it calls it as the sale price. But the investor is purchasing it. When it purchases, it has to pay additional front end load or the uh, additional commission. So you write here NAV into 1 plus front end load percentage. That's how the formula is. Then there is a just der mathematical derivation of the above formula. Think the other way around. Exit load. When the uh, investor wants to exit the company, it is called as the exit load. But when you are exiting, 
you are exiting you will go to the mutual fund company and sell your units the mutual fund company is repurchasing those units and therefore it is called as the repurchase price therefore it is called as the repurchase price is equal to nav into 1 minus back end load percentage got it guys this also has the variation in terms of the formula and we will call it as the nav into 1 minus back end load percentage are we clear everybody so one is the entry load other is the exit load entry load when the mutual uh, the, when the investor is entering the mutual fund company mutual fund company is selling units to the to the unit holder so sale price into one plus nav into one plus front end load percent exit load when we as an investor are exiting when we exit we are giving the units back to the mutual fund company so mutual fund company is repurchasing the unit so it will become nav into one minus back end load percentage are we clear everybody and then obviously there will be the variations as can be seen here so this was about the concept of loads from 2009 say we removed the concept of front end load but there are questions which are asked so we should know it then comes the concept of required return now, one is the expected return. Say, for example, I'll give you an example here to understand this whole formula. So, don't worry. Suppose I am a broker of Access Mutual Fund. Access Mutual Fund pays me 5% of the NAV as a commission or a brokerage. Now, suppose I come to you and I tell you how much return do you want. So, you will say that if I pay you 100 rupees, if I pay you 100 rupees, then I want a 15% on 100 that is equal to rupees 15 will be the return that I want. So what is the expected return percentage that you want? You want 15 rupees return? I will tell you okay 15 rupees return. But the company is not getting the full 100 rupees guys. You have to understand this. Company will out of the 100 rupees company has to pay me 5 rupees as the commission. So now we are left with 95 rupees. So 15 upon 95. So 15 upon 95. This is going to be 15 divided by 95. This is going to be 15.78. Plus whatever recurring expenses is the company is going to incur say 3%. So total will be 18.78% is going to be the required return. 18.78 is going to be the required return. Meaning the mutual fund company will have to earn 18.78 out of which 3% will go here. 15.78 they will earn on the net 95 rupees that they have received. See, again, I'm telling you, I am a broker with Access Mutual Fund. You are my client. I will come to you and I will ask you, how much return do you want? You will say 15%. I will tell you, okay, give me 100 rupees. I will give you 15% return. Simple. But now think from the mutual fund point of view. Mutual fund also has to earn 15%, but not on 100, on the 95. Because mutual fund company is going to get only 95 net rupees because out of the 100 received from the client, 5 will come to me. So mutual fund company net receives only 95. In that 95, it has to earn 15 rupees. So 15.78 net, it has to earn. Gotcha, everybody. So 15.78% plus there will be recurring expenses of 3%. There will be recurring expenses of 3%. So total in all, we will get 18.78 is the going to be the required return. Now, how do you write this down in terms of interpretation? Expected return percentage upon 1 minus initial expenses. Your expected return was 15. 1 minus 0 0.05 goes to so 0.95 plus whatever is the recurring expenses that is going to give me the required return to be earned by the mutual fund company to satisfy my client. I hope we are clear. So with this we complete the required return concept as well. Next concept is called as the dividend equalization reserve a very crucial concept and if it comes in the examination you have to answer it in the way ICAI wants it. So here is the whole uh, format for you. But let's first understand what exactly is the dividend equalization reserve concept. Now, suppose I purchase a mutual fund company's unit on 1st of April and 
Suppose you purchase the unit on 25th of December. On 31st of December, as of that date, whoever is the owner of units of that mutual fund company will get dividend. Company has declared dividend on 31st December and whoever is the owner will get dividend as of 31st December. Now, I have purchased these units from, from 1st of April. So, 9 months you have purchased on 25th of December. So, 5 days. Now, in 5 days you are going to get the same dividend that I am going to get for keeping it for 9 months. Obviously, it is not acceptable. So, comes the concept of dividend equalization reserve which says that if uh, you are now entering after a certain time you are now entering the our mutual fund company and you want to purchase our mutual fund company's units then you will have to bring a dividend equalization reserve which is the dividend that we are going to give in the future that much equivalent amount which does not belong to you you will have to give it up front so for example if the company declares a dividend on 31st of december and you are entering on 25th december so from the first uh, first april to 25th December, whatever earning that the company has done, you will have to bring a share of it. Have you done partnership accounts, goodwill, in that when the partner enters in the middle of the year, he brings the goodwill for his share of profit. This is the same concept. So for the nine months, you will bring the dividend equalization reserve. Now on 31st of December, when the company distributes the dividend, it will give the dividend from the profit earned in the last nine months to all the unit holders. And now even if you get the full dividend of which you have already paid as dividend equalization reserve, so it will nullify. And the person who is holding it for the nine months will feel secure that, okay, now he gets the whole dividend to take for himself. I'll, I'll give you a small example here also. So say for example, the mutual fund company, suppose you purchased on 1st of April at the rate rupees 10. And say for example, your friend is purchasing on 25th of December. So for this period, whatever profit the mutual fund company has earned, he will have to get it as dividend equalization reserve. So that on 31st of December, on 31st of December, when the company gives the dividend, both of them will be at par because now obviously he doesn't deserve this dividend, but he has already paid a dividend equalization reserve. So say for example, he has paid a dividend equalization of minus 5 as in he has paid. So minus 5 and now he will get the dividend uh, of 5. So this will offset. So he will get net 0 dividend and he does not deserve also. And in return, he uh, who has purchased on 1st of April will get plus 5 dividend, which he totally deserves. Got it? So, this is the main concept of dividend equalization reserve. Now, it may also happen vice versa. Suppose I purchased a mutual fund unit on 1st of April and now on 31st of December, I want to quit the company or I want to sell my mutual fund units. So, company will repay you the dividend equalization reserve that it has earned in the 9 months. Got it? So, the way if you are entering the mutual fund company, you have to bring your share of dividend equalization reserve. If you are exiting the company, you will also get your share of dividend equalization reserve. Got it, guys? So, this basically is the concept of DER, dividend equalization reserve. Let's read. We know that dividend is distributed by mutual fund company on a particular date. Suppose if an investor has purchased mutual fund just before the dividend date, he would get the full dividend even though he became the owner of unit just few days before as compared to the owner of mutual fund who is holding it from many months or duration. To avoid any of the above disparity as new mutual fund investors should ideally not be entitled to any share of income of mutual fund that arose. So, to compensate for above, an dividend equalization payment is added to the cost of each unit. Therefore, as per above the above concept, amount to be recovered at dividend equalization from the investor will be income earned by the mutual fund before the investor has done the investment, divide by the number of units which are there, multiply by the number of units to be issued. So, say for example, 5 lakh rupees is what they have earned and in all there are say 1 lakh units. So, rupees 5 is what he will get as dividend equalization reserve. Rupees 5 is what he will get, uh, he will bring as the dividend equalization reserve. Who? The one who purchase wants to purchase the new units.
So we will tell him NAV plus dividend equalization reserve is what you have to bring. Only then you can purchase our mutual fund units. Got it, guys. So mutual dividend equalization income is added. This is becomes an income to the mutual fund income. Is added to the mutual fund income. The next part, dividend equalization amount to be paid when an investor sells his units before the dividend date. Now, if he sells it, he will get the dividend equalization reserve. To avoid about disparity as mutual fund investor should ideally be entitled to his share of income of mutual fund that arose before his selling of mutual fund. To compensate for the above, an equalization payment is added to his income. So as per above concept, amount to be paid as dividend equalization from the investor is again same invest income earned upon the units before sale multiplied by the number of units that he is selling is the amount he will get. This dividend equalization becomes an expense is reduced from mutual fund income because now the mutual fund hold unit holder is going. So we will take the dividend equalization reserve and go. In short, my mutual fund income will reduce. Calculation of issue price or repurchase price so now this is the format which you have to compulsorily follow i have given the example it will become very easy income of first month is 50 total income will become 250 income per unit so see total number of units is 50 income per unit is 5 so total income is 250 and now the new investor wants to come so if he wants to come we will tell him that okay we are ready to give you 10 units but for that 5 rupees is what you have to bring because that is the income that we have earned in that month. So total 50 rupees is what he brings. Now the total income is 60 into 5, 300. Of that 50 is the dividend equalization reserve. Got it guys. 5 per unit is his additional dividend. <coughs> 5 per unit is the dividend uh, equalization reserve that he has bought as his share of goodwill kind of a thing. It is the income for the mutual fund company. Income of the next, of the second month say is 60, <coughs> sorry, is uh, say income per unit is 2. Total number of units now we have is 60. So 60 into 2, 120 is the income. Now if some unit holder is leaving, so we will have to pay him how much? So 5 units is what he has and he is selling it. Total 5 rupees he has earned plus 2 rupees he has earned in the second month. Total 7 rupees is what he has earned. 35 rupees is his dividend equalization reserve which we will pay him. So from 65 he has sold. From total uh, 300 plus 120. 300 was the first month's income plus 120. 420 minus 35. This will become 385. This will become 385. So 55 into 7 per unit. 385 is his current income. Again income of the third month. Again, the same situation will happen. Dividend distributed, if there is any dividend is to be distributed, the, uh, all the number of units which are there, multiply by the dividend distributed is 2 per unit, total 110, and this will become your balance. Got it? Now, there will also give you portfolio appreciation. Portfolio appreciation will not come here because it is like an unrealized gain. So, I will not pay dividend equalization reserve on an unrealized gain. Ha! Huh, this, you have made a real income, income of first month, income of second month. On this real income, you can ask for dividend equalization reserve because the mutual fund company has really earned it. Right? So, that is what is to be seen. So, portfolio appreciation should not be considered for dividend as mutual fund dividend is distributed only on realized. Got it, guys? Done. Now, calculation of issue price. In case of DER, how will the issue price be calculated? Original NAV plus entry load plus dividend equalization reserve is also to be collected. So, this will become the issue price. And when the redemption is to be done, so again, opening NAV, Exit load is to be reduced and dividend equalization is what we will pay him. We will give it to him. So for him, it is like a income. So this will become the redemption price. Let's take an example to understand this. Suppose the opening nav is 10. Entry load is say, uh, say 15%. So 1.5 we will add. Dividend equalization is uh, reserve you have to bring 5. So total you will have to pay 16.5 rupees. So 5 rupees here like this. Dividend equalization reserve 5 rupees you have to bring. So total 16.5 you have to get. And on the other side, suppose here if you are selling your mutual fund, repurchase redemption will become this way. Say 15 is the redemption price. Exit load say 
10%. So this will become 13.5. So you will get net 13.5 plus your share of dividend equalization reserve you will get. So say 2.5 your share of dividend equalization reserve and this will become 16. This is how the whole calculation of NAV happens. I hope we are clear. So issue price, redemption price, gotcha everybody. Done, 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 done. Okay, calculation of total NAV in case of dividend equalization reserve. Now, when we are calculating the total NAV, the portfolio appreciation will become a part of it. So opening NAV, portfolio appreciation, income of all months, dividend equalization received on issue of units, dividend equalization received paid on repurchase of units, less dividend distribution, all the adjustments done and what you are left with is called as the closing net asset value. I hope we are clear with the whole concept of dividend equalization reserve. I'll tell you. First, we should know this statement. Make the See what is the income of the first month. Say it is uh, 50. 5 per unit. Total 50 units are there. So total 250 is your income of the first month. Now a new investor wants to purchase the units. We will tell him how many units you want. He says I want 10 units. We will say 5 rupees is what we have earned in the last 9 months. So 5 into 10, 50 rupees we will have to get as dividend equalization reserve. He brings and becomes a part of our unit holder. So total 60 units. Income per unit 5. So total will become 300. Got it, everybody. Now comes income of the second month. In the second month, more 60 rupees income is what we have earned. Income per unit is the same. Sorry. 2 rupees is what we have earned in the second month. Total, we have 60 units. So 60 into 2, 120 is the total income of the mutual fund company. Now in the next month, a person wants to uh, sell his units. So we will say, okay. Total, we have earned 420 rupees for 60 units. 420 rupees, 300 plus 120, no? So, 420 rupees for 60 units. So, 7 rupees per unit we have earned. How many units do we have? 5. So, 7 into 5, 35 is what we will give you as dividend equalization reserve. Out of the total amount, whatever dividend is to be distributed, we will distribute it and we will be left with the balance. Got it, guys? As far as issue price is concerned, NAV on the rate of purchase plus entry load plus dividend equalization reserve received in case of redemption nav minus exit load but dividend equalization reserve you are getting so it is a cost as such for the company so that will be added and that will give us the redemption price nav calculation is simple opening nav plus portfolio appreciation units issued whatever amount you have received units redeemed whatever you have paid income expenses and portfolio appreciation and dividend equalization received and paid. All of that adjusted will give us the closing map. And with this, we are now coming to almost the last concept of this chapter. And that is hedge fund portfolio management service fees. This will consist of two. One fixed part and the other is the variable part. Based on the percentage of assets under management. So, one fixed fee will be there. Suppose you give me 10 crore rupees. I will say you irrespective of anything. Of 10 crore, 1% I will take as my fees. So what is 10 crores into 1%? Probably it will be 10 lakh. So 10 lakh is my fixed fee. Plus uh, the variable fees is dependent on whatever asset under management I am able to keep. Anything which beyond goes uh, beyond say 15 crore, we will pay you 10% more. So say the total becomes a 17 crore. Anything beyond 15 crore, so 17 minus 15, so 2 crore into say 10%, so 20 lakh more is what you will get as the variable. So 20 lakh plus 10 lakh is equal to 30 lakh will become the portfolio management fees, will become the portfolio management fees. Hey, Samji Guru, everybody. So fixed fee is given 10 lakh. Variable fees is dependent on a certain benchmark. Suppose the certain benchmark is say 17 or 15 crore. If the amount, uh, asset under management goes beyond 15 crores, then in that case, we will give you 10% extra, whatever amount beyond 15 crores. Now my portfolio becomes of 17 crore. So 2 crore, it has gone beyond 15 crore. So 10% of that will become 20 lakh to 20 lakh and 10 lakh total 30 lakh. So this is how we will calculate the total service fees of this hedge fund manager. 
<coughs> I hope we are clear with all the concepts. And on that note, we complete all the concepts. So now, the practical sums. What do you feel? Should we do the practical sums? Definitely, sir. Let's quickly do it. So obviously, we'll not get into the depth, but the concepts that we have now just done, the formulas that now we have just done, let's utilize them. And I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, we'll be able to manage the practical sums quickly as well. So, chalo, lights, camera, rolling, action for the practical sums. Calculate the today's NAV if the following details are given. Yesterday's NAV 12.87. So, do we remember that formula? Yesterday's NAV is given. Then, in this today, we will add the portfolio appreciation. Whatever units we have issued, the cash received, the units redeemed, the cash paid, all of that will be adjusted and we will be left with today's NAV uh, divided by the outstanding number of units after adjusting the uh, units issued and units redeemed and we will get the final today's NAV per unit. So, calculate today's NAV if the following details are given. Yesterday's NAV is equal to 12.87. Today's uh, number of outstanding units 1.25 crores, face value rupees 10, expenses rupees 1 lakh, assume sales NAV and repurchase NAV to be at rupees 12.87. Now yesterday's NAV is given to be 12.87 multiplied by the outstanding number of units that we had last year was 1.25 crores to which we will adjust the portfolio appreciation if any to which any net re receipts that we are going to get and also the dividend so that adjustment and finally we will get yeah, yeah we will get our final nav per unit okay where's the appreciation of portfolio oh it's here it's here it's here so yes appreciation of portfolio today 12 lakhs units new subscribe 2 lakhs so 2 lakhs multiplied by 12.87 amount received paid 0.75 into 12.87 dividend received 1 lakh rupees so added your appreciation of portfolio 12 lakh all of this divided by the outstanding number of units to 126.25 lakhs in all including the 1.25 crores at the start all of this will give us the new nav per unit so i hope we are clear next is the return from the close ended fund quickly we make purchase a three year close ended fund when the fund was launched at an opening of a price of rupees 10 per unit since then the units got listed on the stock exchange after a year nav of the fund was rupees 12.5 now in this closed ended fund we are always looking for the market price per unit how the units of the fund were trading at a discount of 25 percent during the year a dividend of five percent was given so this five percent is always calculated on rupees 10 so 0.5 is the dividend received now what is the market price here the unit was listed on stock exchange after a year nav of the fund was 12.5 however they were trading at a discount of 25 so 12.5 minus 25 percent so 12.5 minus 25 percent remember the discount or premium is calculated on the nav so nav is 12.5 minus 25 percent it is 9.375 so 9.375 is the closing nav opening nav is 10 0.5 is the dividend received divided by 10 and we will get the final 1.25 percent negative return so this was a closed ended fund now next is this here we have to calculate the uh, annual earning now again see here issue 20 lakh units at 10 per unit so we have received a 200 lakh rupees relevant in issue expenses were 12 lakh so out of the 200 lakh received 12 lakh has gone into initial expenses so now we are left with the 188 lakh rupees then they are saying that they are in planning to in uh, uh, if it invested the funds so raised in the capital market at portfolio and build a portfolio of 185 lakhs so out of 188 185 gone so now we are left with 3 lakh in the cash balance see this is what this whole question is all about calculating also the closing cash balances as the situation so here 200 lakh initially we had minus 185 lakh we invested 12 lakh is the relevant issue expenses 3 lakh is our bank then during the month it disposed of some of the securities costing rupees 60 lakhs for 63 lakhs. So inflow is 63 lakh. See this inflow proceeds from sale of securities. Eight of which, um, sorry, 
and use the proceeds in purchasing securities of 56 lakh more securities are purchased so cost of securities purchased 56 lakh all that i am uh, done with i am just circling then fund management expenses was 8 lakh of which a 10 percent was in arrears so total 7.2 is the fund management the real uh, cash expense and 0 0.8 is the accrued part so total 8 lakhs earn dividend amounting to 2 lakh and distributed 80 percent of the realized earnings see this 80 percent of the realized earnings now pay attention you have earned a dividend of you have earned a dividend of 8 lakh sorry 2 lakh rupees so dividend received 2 lakh rupees of which 80 percent is distributed so distribution of dividend from this to 1.6 80 percent is distributed and also there is a capital gain which we have made see this what they have said the during the month of april it disposed of some of the securities costing rupees 60 for 63 lakhs so you purchased it for 60 sold it for 63 so 3 lakh rupees is your capital gain of this 80 percent is distributed which is 2.4 this will give you the closing cash balance as 6 uh, 68 minus 67.2.8 lakhs got it guys so this is your calculation of closing cash balance plus the closing market value we will add which is 198 lakhs which is clearly given in the question so on 31 34 2012 the market value of the portfolio was 198 lakhs mr akash an investor subscribed to 100 units and disposed of what is his annual earning out of this 198 plus 0.8 0.8 is the arrear so here 7.2 is already taken care of but total accrued expenses were 8 lakh of which 7.2 was paid 90% was paid 0.8 is still accrued so we deduct it here for calculating the net asset value this total 7.2 plus 0.8 is 8 of which 7.2 is cash which is already adjusted here so the remaining 0.8 is outstanding which is adjusted here and then divided by the number of units we will get the closing nap Got it guys? So this was the crux of the question. Then this is a question on dividend reinvestment plan. A person have a fund having a 300 units uh, shows its net asset value of 8.7, 9.45 at the beginning and closing uh, of the period, end of the year. Mutual fund has given two options, pay dividend 0 0.05 per unit and capital gain or these distributions are to be reinvested at an average NAV of 8.65 per unit. So it is up to us what we want. So here the change in price is 9.45 to 8.75. This is our income plus we will get 0.75 as income plus 0.6 as income so 2.05 is the total return on an investment of 8.75 23.43 one option is this the other option is to reinvest reinvest the capital gain and dividend so dividend plus capital gain is 0.75 plus 0.6 which is equal to 1.35 multiply by total how many units are there total 300 units are there so total uh, the income that we will get is so 405 rupees received as dividend is reinvested at 8.65 see here these dividend distributions are to be reinvested at an average nav of 8.65 per unit so 405 divided by 8.65 will give you 80 46.82 units you already had 300 units so 300 plus uh 46.82 units will give you 46.82 into the closing nav 9.45 and it is 3277.45 so total reward that we have got is uh 620 so 2625 was our original investment and now 3277.45 so we have made a profit of 652 over investment of 2625 24.85 so dividend reinvestment plan is better as compared to your dividend payout because this is giving 23.43 and this is giving 24.85 got it guys so you're in this dividend reinvestment plan always remember to calculate things on totality see your opening nav in totality was how much so we invested 8 point, uh, 300 units into 8.75 so 2625 we invested today's value after receiving the additional units at 9.45 is 3277.45 so 3277.45 minus 2625 and we get 652.45 on an investment of 2625, we will get 24.85 as our total return. Got it, guys? That next is the calculation of NAV of, previous, of various years. This is a technical question as such. We'll take a lot of time, but I'll just give you an idea. 
always remember that whatever investment that you are doing will give you a holding period return and annual return suppose if you have invested for 9 months the return that you are getting is holding period return multiply that by 12 divide by 9 you will get the actual annualized return so use that annualized return to calculate the holding period return and vice versa and this is what is done in this whole question as well obviously it's a lengthy question so i'll not get into too much of details but when you solve it and if you get any doubts then you can definitely get back to me and i will help you with the same next Alex, a practicing chartered accountant, can earn a 15% return by investing in equity shares of his own. He is considering recently announced equity fund based on which initial expenses are 6%, recurring expenses are 2%. So remember, 15% is the return that my client wants. But out of 100 rupees, the mutual fund will receive uh, 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 only 94. Why? Because out of 100, 6 will go to the commission agent. So 15 divide by 94 plus 2 percent additionally that they have to make so this will become how much 15.95 plus 2 equal to 17.95 equal to 17.95 17.96 the rounding of difference got it everybody yes sir okay then uh okay Mr. Alex annual professional income. So this first part is 17.96. Then there is another part wherein it says that the and Mr. Alex annual professional income is 40 lakhs. Now he has two options either to invest directly in the mutual fund or he creates his own portfolio. But if he creates his own portfolio, then he will to invest, he will have to spend 10% more time in making his own portfolio. And as a result, his practice will get affected. So Mr. Alex current professional income 40 lakhs. His portfolio value is rupees 50 lakhs and now he is spending 10% of his time to manage his portfolio. If he spends this time on professional, his professional income will go up in the same proportion. So either invest in mutual fund or into professional income. Funds NAV will grow at the rate 30% if he invest in the mutual fund. Chal, so let's see the difference. Annual professional income 40 lakhs that is already given in the question that he has his annual professional income 40 lakhs. He is planning his portfolio is over 50 lakhs, 50 lakhs, right? So portfolio 50 lakhs on which if he invest in the mutual fund, it will give him 15% return to 7.5. So total will become 47.5. What if he invests on his own? So 40. Sorry. Hmm. And when he will invest on his own, he will get only 6.5 as his income and additional total. So this will become 50.5. So obviously, which is better is what we have to suggest. See here, if he invests in this, I'll just give you an idea. See here, if he invests in this mutual fund, if he spends his time on professional, his professional income will go up in the same proportion. So 40 plus he is now spending time so additional 10 percent so 44 and he is now investing in a multi-cap fund they have said he is thinking to invest in his entire portfolio in a multi-cap fund assuming that it will grow at the rate 13 percent so 50 into 13 percent 6.5 so 40 plus 4 plus 6.5 will give us 50.5 if he does not do that if he, cre he creates his own portfolio and invest then he will get 15 percent on 50 lakh which is 7.5 the total will be 47.5 because he will have to forego this 4 lakh got it guys yeah got it guys done can earn 15 percent by investing in equity share on his own but if he does on his own then obviously we know that we will uh, lose out on a lot of uh, clients which will give us 4 lakh rupees done next question the equity link saving scheme of a mutual fund is rupees 10. The public offer price, this public offer price is basically called as the sale price and uh, uh, is rupees 10.204 and the redemption price is rupees 9.8. This is called as the repurchase price. Now remember, sale price means when the investor is purchasing the mutual fund. So the formula is sale price in uh, is equal to NAV into 1 plus brokerage percent which is the load percentage. So sale price is equal to nav into 1 plus entry load percentage what is the selling price selling price is 10.204 
is equal to nav. What is the nav? Nav is 10 into 1 plus exit load percentage. The balancing figure that we are going to get here is going to be whatever. So 2% and 2.04% as the case is. All right. Yeah, see here, 10.204 is equal to 10 upon, sorry, 1 minus, oh, maybe I have uh, made a mistake here, just a moment. Okay, so my calculation is correct, maybe some here, error here, see here, so 10.204 divided by 10, this one will also come here, minus 1 will give us the front end load, so 10 divided by, sorry, 10.204 divided by 10 minus 1 will in 200 will give us 2.04 percent is the front end load check out here okay so remember in case of loads front end when the investor is planning to enter the mutual fund company the mutual fund company is selling him the unit so sale price is equal to because he is entering he will have to bear the uh, uh the load cost the commission cost so NAV into 1 plus front end load and the exit load is concerned it will be divided and we will get 2 percent okay next again a very nice question yeah so you're just focus on mutual fund a because once this is done the others can be taken care of very much easily so here we have 2 lakh as the amount of investment divided by 10 you will get the opening NAV dividend yield is 3 percent NAV as on 31-3-2022 is 10.5 and again annualized yield is given. So, whenever annualized yield is given, we can calculate the holding period return and that is what is to be done in this whole sum. See here, number of units in each scheme, how do you find out? 2 lakh is the investment, 10 is your NAV at the time of purchase. So, you will get the number of units, 20,000 units. Value investment at the end. So, 20,000 units are there into 10.5 per unit is 2 lakh 10,000. Sorry. Yeah. Right? Done. Then, Next is yield on each fund. What is called as the yield guys? Yield basically means what is your return. Yield is nothing but your return. So I had invested to a 2 lakh rupees. Now the value is 2 lakh 10,000. So 10,000 is my yield. Plus I have received dividend of rupees 6,000 as per the question. See here dividend yield 3%. So 2 lakh into 3% is 6,000. So I have received here dividend yield of 2 lakh multiply by 3% and that is 6,000 rupees. So, total 16,000 I have earned on an investment of say 2 lakh, I have earned the yield of 8%. Same we have to do for B and C as well. Number of days investment held, again I am telling you the period of holding, it will be based on the period of holding that we have just calculated. So, holding period return multiply by Again, I am telling you the number of days here, the number of days are given. So, 365 days upon the number of days for which it is held is equal to annual return. Now, pay attention. Here, the annual return is given. Holding period return, we have just calculated as 8. So, we will say 8 into 365 upon number of days is equal to annual return which is 9.73 again which is given in the question 9.73 is the annualized yield yield is return now just solve this question and you will get your final answer so suppose number of days will go here annualized return will come here so 8 upon 9.733 into 365 we will get 300 days are we clear everybody yes sir got it okay so yes date of original investment now we can calculate once we have the number of days so that was the main crux of this question now here in this question we have to calculate the nav so for calculating the nav we should know the market value now suppose if we had purchased a particular equity share for 28 crores when the price was 1750 so we will say 28 5 28 crores was the value and 1750 was the index. Now, if the index is 2950, what is the market value? And we will get our answer. So, 28 into 2950 divided by 1750 and we will get 47.2. So, this we will get 47.2. Are we clear everybody? So, this is how we will calculate the market value of all the things. Now, the main catch in this question is calculation of the expense ratio. If you observe, they have given us the uh, advisory, management advisory fee 2.75. 3.5 crore, 0.8 crore. So, this becomes the total expense 
plus 3.5 plus 0.8 and it is 7.05. So 7.05 crore is the management fees and 5.50 crores probably is the net asset value probably I'm just assuming and that is how we will get the expense ratio 5.50 crore units okay so we get the expense per unit and then the total nav also we calculate as 140.44 so 7.05 divided by 140.44 or 5.02 percent again you can just go through this you so will get the expense ratio also now this is the calculation for dividend equalization reserve which we have already done when we solved the dividend equalization concept so i have already solved it practically with the numbers so i'm sure you can now do it for yourself see this income of april is how much 300 lakhs it is given Income of uh, April is given as 22.95. Sorry, my bad. Yeah, so 22.95 lakhs. Total, how many units are there? 300 lakh units are there. So 22.95 divided by 300. So 22.95 divided by 300 will give you 0 0.0765 per unit. This is the dividend equalization reserve that the investor will have to bring if he wants to purchase a new mutual fund of this company. Now, say uh, it issued 6 lakh units so 6 lakh units were issued to them we told bring 0 0.0765 as dividend equalization reserve total of this made 306 lakh units this 0 0.4590 was added to the nav and this is how the system works then income again of may was added then whoever left the uh, mutual fund were given dividend equalization reserve whatever dividend was asked to be distributed 70 percent was paid this is the calculation of the issue price repurchase price and the final closing nav look at the issue price opening nav plus the load that you have to pay plus the dividend equalization reserve that you have to pay look at the closing nav uh, op uh, the nav that is there opening nav minus the exit load plus the dividend equalization the reserve that you are going to receive and then the closing nav also at the portfolio appreciation issue of fresh units income received units redeemed all of this together made what made the closing net asset value got it everybody yes sir and then we have the calculation of fees payable here there is a hedge fund currently asset of 20 crores here they have said that fund charge is 0.1% of portfolio asset. This is a fixed fee. So on 20 crore, 0.1% will be paid for sure irrespective of anything. Then they have said that if the value goes above 21 crores, then we will pay additional 2% as incentive. Now they have said that the increase is 29%. So 20 plus 29 percent, how much is this? 20 plus 29 percent is equal to 25.8. What is the benchmark? Benchmark is 21. So say 4.8 extra you have on into 2.8. So 4 crore 80 lakh into 2 percent is 9 lakh 60 thousand. So 9.6 lakhs plus 0.1 percent of 20 crore 2 lakh is fixed. 9 lakh 60 thousand is variable. Total 11 lakh 60 thousand is the fund management fees that you have to pay. Look at the other part 4.5 percent. Now 20 plus 4.5 percent is equal to 20.9 crores. Benchmark is 21 crores. If you don't exceed the benchmark, you will not get any variable incentive. But fixed is paid. 2 lakh is paid. That's it. And other is loss. Obviously, only 2 lakh is paid even in case of a loss because that is the fixed amount that is to be paid. Okay. So I hope with this all the questions have been taken care of so practical questions done formula done what else do you want in life what's up okay then so time for me to say hasta la vista guys i hope you had a great time attending the session and uh, hopefully we will be up with the new session very very soon do like the video do share your comments and subscribe so you get more updates. Take care guys. Keep smiling. Thank you so much. Keep working very hard for your goals. The more you work hard, the more better your luck will become. The more better you will get opportunities and the more growth you will have. There will be tough times as it is for everyone, whoever is living. Everybody faces on a daily basis tough times. It is up to us to either fall down on those tough things or fight back those tough things. 
the more we have a fighter attitude the better it will be for us at times even though we show a fighter attitude we may still fall down but you know that's what we are made of that's what the humans are the best at fighting even more in a tougher way and ensuring things go our way so there will be ups there will be downs let the downs not overcome your uh, uh, thought process and when the good things are going good flow go with the flow chalo keep smiling thank you so much hasta la vista bye bye take care thank you so much